you're all very welcome here tonight. This is the second of our two talks to celebrate the centenary of the birth of the servant of God, Father Luigi Giussani, who is the founder of the ecclesial movement, Communion Liberation. I would especially like to welcome Mauro Crina, who is zooming in from Milan, even though he's generally to be found in Los Angeles, uh, and Filippo, who's sitting next to me here, a dear friend of ours. Um, and like a couple of weeks ago, the purpose of our get together here tonight is to share with one another the mark that Chisani has left on, in our lives and left in history and how people have been changed by this encounter with him. Um, I was listening last week to um, a recording on YouTube and it's normally not a person that I would listen to, um, but it was Sister Breege McKenna, who is an Irish nun, um, but she's been living for years in America. And I was very struck by her. She was, you know, really speaking very passionately about the fact that we have to witness to one another. There's no point hiding our stories, you know? We have to share our experiences. We have to share what's happened with each other and with other people. And I met the movement when I was young, when I was 24. And it was a transformative experience for me. When I say I met the movement, I met a person, a priest called Father Agostino. Um, he was full of passion and joy. And I was curious about that. And I suppose I didn't realize that I, I, that I was looking for something in my life. Um, when I listened to the, the, the extracts from the book of Father Giussani, I knew that there was treasure in the mud here. And so that was 30 years ago. And as the years have gone on, um, the Lord stepped into my life eight years ago in, in, in a moment of deeper conversion. And it was shortly after the year of mercy. And I really felt that he looked down on my brokenness um, and he had just had this perfect mercy for me. And he held me very, very close to him and he embraced me and this mercy and love changed everything. Um, and it allowed me to open up. It opened something in me and it gave me a passion and an interest for things that I didn't necessarily have before. Um, and, you know, often we hear this word mission that we have to go out in the mission, but mission has to, the work has to be done on yourself first. And in my case, and a lot of ours, it's not that we do the work, that we make this decision. It can be that the Lord steps into our life and does it for us. And it's a simple begging. I did a lot of begging at that time. Um, it was a particularly difficult time. And he does answer us, often in very unexpected ways. And this openness that I felt, this kind of yes to everything, um, transformed so it, it's not that you you know you want to go out and change the world you have a fire in your belly that makes you that you can't help yourself so it, it's not like a passing on of a, a of a doctrine it's it's just this 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 fire that that um that touches you and that you can't but help yourself go out on mission and mission can be just simply looking at the person in front of you. Aquinas called it um, grace through nature uh, and it's ironic how the Lord touches us in all our different personalities and we're going to see tonight how our witnesses, how they were touched in their own nature, their own ways because we're all touched in a very very different way. Um, and I'm curious to hear, to hear all our witnesses tonight how, how that is. Um, Father Giussani used to say that singing is the highest expression of the human heart. Just like a child and his mother, it's something that's there. You belong and a song arises. And it's very much part of our charism to start a meeting with a song. And that awakens our heart, it puts us in a position. Um, so tonight we have chosen um, a beautiful song that kind of speaks of our experience my father sings to me. So we have uh, Rafi and Tom and, and Owen and Aileen um, who've been working very hard in this song just for us to, I suppose, that chance to open our hearts. If the world is a voice and it sings with a mission In my life there is a chance and I've chosen to listen Ask me the words you want. 
sings a movement that keeps on moving me. So let's just take a look at a very short video uh, to see where, this, where the story began. The fundamental question for the human person, for any person, in any time until the end of history, ever since the message that God became man, was brought, entered the world, the greatest question of life is this. No greater question is conceivable. That is, the human person cannot imagine a greater question for his freedom. Christ, yes or no? Luigi Gisani was born on October 15, 1922, in the town of Desio, in the Lombardy region of Italy. His father, Beniamino, was an artisan with sympathies for the socialist cause who passed on to his son a thirst for justice and a passion for reason. From his mother, Angelina, young Luigi received the gift of a deep-seated and well-educated Catholic faith. His love for learning and culture were evident when Luigi entered the seminary at the age of 10. Years later, following his ordination, Father Gisani was assigned to teach theology, but a chance meeting with a group of young people marked a new course in his life. This encounter convinced him that the experience of Christian faith was becoming detached from the experience of daily life and was reaching a crisis point. And then I left to devote myself through teaching religion in public schools to the attempt to communicate religion in a way that would be more easily acceptable to young people. Going up the steps of Berchet High School, I asked myself, what am I coming here to do? I come here to give these kids the opportunity to know what I have known, because why should I have known and felt the reasons and them not? Then freedom will show the road ahead as it wills. The Lord says, Whoever follows me will have eternal life and a hundredfold here below. And I used to say in class, if you do not desire eternal life, I understand you because you don't have much imagination. But if you do not desire the hundredfold here below, then you are fools. Though Giussani hadn't planned to start a new church movement, he understood that his charism truly was a continuation of Christ's presence in history and was thus an answer to contemporary humanity's desire for truth, beauty, justice, and happiness. We, like everyone else, want a better humanity, but it is not possible for humanity to love better by itself, alone, with only its projects, its fantasies, and its energies. This is what we want to say with the term communion and liberation. It is only the communion that God made possible himself through Christ. It is only in the communion among men who recognize this, that in expanding itself creates oases of truer humanity. Father Giussani was filled with wonder as he saw communion and liberation communities spring up across the globe, generating new cultural initiatives and charitable works. CL can now be found in more than 90 countries on every inhabited continent. As the movement grew and matured, Giussani continued to remind its members that their primary task was to acknowledge and announce the fact of God's saving mercy made present in Christ. The mystery is mercy remains the last word, even on all the awful possibilities of history. For this reason, existence expresses itself as ultimate ideal 
in begging. The real protagonist of history is the beggar. Christ who begs for man's heart, and man's heart that begs for Christ. Father Giussani died in February 2005, just days before the passing of his dear friend, Pope John Paul II. At Giussani's funeral, then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger captured the essence of this humble Milanese priest whose passion for Christ had impacted so many. Father Giussani was touched, or better, wounded, by the desire for beauty. He was not satisfied, however, with just any ordinary beauty, with beauty, however banal. He sought, rather, beauty itself, infinite beauty. And thus, he found Christ. Um, that has always struck me, uh, Gisani, when he said, you know, Christ, yes or no. And it's as simple as that. Um, and this, this man and, you know, the way he lived is a possibility for each one of us to live like this um, by saying yes or no to Christ. Um, and it's not a case that, you know, uh, the Pope a couple of years ago when he met us, he said, you know, it's, you, you, you don't keep your charism in a mausoleum that you go to visit or that it's not something you're, you're visiting, looking at, observing. It's something you become immersed in and this possibility for change for this new person in Christ is possible for all of us. It's not just the way Jasani lived is for us too. It's not just transmitting a way of living. It's, it's something much more. And Jasani said this, Christ, yes or no. So we either embrace life with this openness or we, we try to protect ourselves and we have our hands like this in front of us. There are the two possibilities. That's what he said. It's a very definite yes or no. Um, now we're going to listen to our first witness our first speaker, and unfortunately, because of the time difference, she lives in Taiwan, we can't actually hear her live. She's very anxious to come in there now. Um, and she has an amazing um, experience. Uh, her life was inexorably changed by a chance meeting with some people, some of us sitting here um, in Dublin a couple of years ago. It's a short testimony, it's about eight minutes long. Hello, this is Ning from Taiwan. Uh, in 2010, just before Christmas, I flew from the Netherlands to Ireland to start my research trip in Dublin. On the second night of my trip, I wandered around in a touristic area, Temple Bar. I came across a gallery, seeing that it's an exhibition about the American novelist Flannery O'Connor. Since I used to study English literature in Taiwan, I was attracted by the theme, and I walked in. A lady came to me with a big smile. Shall I give you a tour to introduce this exhibition? I said, yes, sure, thank you. This lady talked about different short stories about Flannery O'Connor and how she depicted the humanities deeply through her characters. After a while, another girl came in, looking like the same age as me. She was also in the exhibition team. Later, it came also her family. They were happy to see me, an Asian girl from far away. Knowing that I came from Taiwan, just finished my master degree on art education, and that I, I continue traveling in Europe, he said to me, you are full of initiative. He invited me to go to London in the coming weekend to join an, an event of Father Caron. Then I realized these people belong to a Catholic movement called Communion and Liberation. I gave him my phone number and said, I will think about it. Even though I didn't know what the event was all about, from their eyes, I could see passion and joy. It must be something so beautiful that they wish for me as a stranger to go with them so much, I thought. So after one day, I replied to him that I will go. 
This is the beginning of my journey with CL. It started with a series of invitations. The family in my stories is our dear beyond this family, with the father, Mauro, his wife, Margaret, his daughter, Maria, and his son, Stefano. And the lady who gave me the tour was Annie Delvin. By that time, she was still a student. Now she's a nun of the Missionary Sisters of St. Charles Borromeo. After 10 years, what Mauro said to me, you are full of initiatives, still echoes in my heart. It reminds me of the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector in the Bible. Here is a beautiful comment I read from a scholar. The desire to know the other person leads to a proper relationship with the other. Zacchaeus took the initiative to see Jesus from the tree. And then Jesus built upon that initiative. It changed Zacchaeus' life. Christ was invited not only into Zacchaeus' house, but also into his heart. In my case, I also took the initiative to take a look, to see what's been prepared for me. With this openness towards life, I realized God had paved the way for me. All I need to do is walk forwards. I was born in a Protestant family in Taiwan which is quite rare. I grew up in the church. My grandparents and my parents are all very religious. I could see they put their trust in God. They are calm when their kids make mistakes or when they have to travel far because they know their children belong to someone higher. They hope their children can follow God instead of just listening to them. So I was raised in a very liberal and joyful environment. It was until I went abroad studying, doing everything on my own, that I started to reflect more on the relationship between God and myself. The encounter with the movement in Dublin was truly a gift that God had prepared for me at a perfect time. I was mature enough to recognize what beauty is and what truth is. In these two months in Dublin, I was invited to join the School of Community. At the time, we read Religious Sense together. This was the first book by Father Gisani I read. It was not easy to understand all, but it was enough for me to know that this author writes with passion and reason. And I knew it's helpful for me to meet God once again. By sharing our experience in daily life, those spiritual values I knew since I was little became clear and concrete. I remember very often during the school of community, people had strong debates. And they were all very honest when talking about their problems in daily lives. Even though most of them were in stable positions in different companies or schools, they were not satisfied with the idea of just fine. It seems to me that they desired more, desired something even greater. And that's the reason they came together, in order to dig into the truth a little more, week by week. After the serious debates and opinion exchange, they would go to have a pint of Guinness in a bar. In CL, I found seriousness and joyfulness often come along serious enough to penetrate our problems while happily enjoying the friendship among us. Now in Taiwan, CL are about 60 people divided into four groups led by four priests from the Fraternity of St. Charles. I am in a diaconia group together with 10 other people who organize the event of CL Taiwan. Our special event for Father, Father Giussani's centenary is a book launch event and an exhibition for Why the Church, Chinese version. In the past 10 years, I have worked as an art educator to organize art exhibitions. It's a joy for me to design the exhibition for CL. For that, I have to read again and again the book of Father Giussani, and it really speaks to me. 
on this occasion of Father Giussani's centenary, I want to thank God for giving CL this charism of Father Giussani. Through him, many people got a fresh start, a chance to say yes to Christ. Through his books, his talks, the songs we sang, all together have become a great education, teaching us how to be a human and to accept the fact that our life is a drama full of meanings. Thank you. This is what I want to say. Special greetings to all the friends in Dublin. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, yesterday I was at a conference uh, for work and because I work for the church we had mass at the conference and um, the priest that was saying mass started to talk um, about authority and I was interested to see what he'd say because we have a different meaning here, I suppose, in, in the movement of what authority is. And he said, you know, we normally, we, we don't really understand what authority is. We think it means that, you know, you have to be obedient to someone or someone has power over you. But he said the Latin word actually is to bring forth, to increase, to cause things to grow or to be reborn taking on the old, but creating something new. And Ning is, so people can be authority figures. Like Ning is an authority figure for us because you can see in her a, a woman fully alive. You know, 10 years on, she said, I thought it was lovely, the echo is still in her heart. It's this kind of lived memory, but it's more than that too, because you can see how passionate she is. You can see even in, you know, in, in that culture, I suppose they wouldn't be normally so expressive but yet you can see that coming through with her and she talks about the gratefulness that she had in the movement for giving her this fresh start this chance to say yes to christ and um, so you know this is a woman alive this is this is what we're interested in this looking at people as authority figures for something we can see that there's something happening there and what is that and to keep that curiosity so finally, Mauro, we are coming to you. It's like, you know, we're, we're, we're building up to this. <laughs> um, and Mauro Prina, we're delighted to have him here. We're very, very lucky as well because he has such a busy, busy schedule because he's the director of thermal dynamics at SpaceX in Los Angeles in California. And I know you're, you're in, in Europe for a couple of days now just at various meetings. So we're really grateful that you've um, just given us this time to share your experience and the impact that Jasani has had in your life and how it's changed the way you look at things. So I'm going to let you take over from here now. Thank you and f sorry for not being there. I was not able to get there. I... Oh, listen, there's always the next time. Don't worry, we we'll keep putting pressure on you to turn up. <laughs> yeah, I finished the meeting at two and that was the the flight, the time of the last flight today. So I'm actually in Lugano right now in Switzerland and I'm flying back to the States tomorrow. And maybe one thing that I like, I'm very grateful for and I wanna focus on this evening is uh, uh, the help I received and received in uh, on the word experience because um, what are things, how to manage them, who am I, um, are um, things that come along, come are discovered in the reaction between the two poles of like the stuff outside of you and what boils up in you in the, in me in the interacting with things I would have never thought to be I mean I was not even planning to be where I'm sitting right now until 2 p.m today and um, it has been life happening this way in encounters, interests, passions that you find in yourself that not even a year ago you knew you had. And um, 
the interaction between like the, the, the interest that you that you find and what is in front of you uh, generate the path that it's every day new and um, that has I mean applies also not on, not only from through human encounters but even in uh, understanding material things like how to build up ceramic heat shields or uh, how to fly vehicles or um, like what type of bolts you should be using like you tried like when you when I went to school I was taught like through examples in books like you have these problems how do you get to the solution but when you are trying to face something new uh, in front of you you don't have all the details like where do you find where do I like this applies to how do you return a rocket from space that, and make it reusable many times that until less than 10 years ago was never done or like I was talking this evening like how do you start up a company to help university students go and experience beauty in nature. Like how all of those things, there is not a playbook. It's like something happens today. Where does that point? Or like you fly and the rocket blows up or uh, it comes back and a piece is melted. So it's a constant learning and a constant refining of the questions that arise in you, in me, in front of uh, events that develop and living within this tension, like almost like, you know, when you turn on the old light bulbs that have two poles and a filament in between, like between those two poles, the current that goes through and generates that light is that interaction that determines the tension that arises in you, in me, in uh, taking steps and uh, move forward and things. And I would have never thought I've been doing what I'm doing and I don't even know, I don't know what's, what's coming down the pipe. Like, I mean, I was tell telling a friend last night that I was fairly skeptical when we start launching a lot of satellites to beam down internet across the whole world. And here we are now, I was talking this afternoon about to use utilize that on boats, traveling across the ocean so you can track things and help not getting lost and I have communicate um, where you're in the middle of Atlantic. So kind of summarizing, I would say, um, putting in front of um, our, your own, my own eye, the fact that the developing of uh, who am I and who is the understanding of the world is moving like the, you guys sang a song that says that said uh, um, asking me to asking why like in the in a relationship with the unknown in front of you you ask why like and uh, not running away even when that ask, when those questions kind of scratch your skin and cause a reaction of like am I sure I'm going down the right path where 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 is all where is all this taking us I don't know I would like to point to that as a great contribution to that I received and received through the men we are celebrating today thanks for that um it just it, 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 I'm just curious um, 
the way yes. I suppose most most of us compartmentalize our experience, you know, um, what we what we hear about maybe in school or community and then our work is a separate thing. And what you're what you're describing there is, you know, a, a different way of looking at things that you're looking at everything, every detail you're asking why. And it's it, it's it's opening up possibilities, not just for yourself personally in your work. I'm just curious, have any of your colleagues, do they notice this in you? That's something a bit different, you know, that you're, because it, it probably wouldn't be the norm, this kind of questioning everything and asking why. Um, I, I mean, from a certain point of view, yeah, it's, it's a tiring exercise because it's, um, it almost leaves you all the time unsettled. But I think that uh, any true pursuit requires that uh, total abandonment to what you find in in experience, because otherwise, is never a true learning. It's never a true new things you face. I mean, like for example, just today we tested sixteen uh, engines on uh, the new booster, but only 14 light up. So like, why did that happen? What happened to the one that didn't light up? And uh, being open to face the, un the, uncer the unknown, the uncertainty in the moment. Um, I think it's the only possibility to truly learn and um, I think what is being helpful for me is that um, when you when you apply that to yourself, then it opens up like the window to like an enormity of unknowns and like that uh, I often have been scared of. And uh, uh, what I think has been fairly consistently unique is uh, through particular people close by or experiences like a, um, sustaining me in front of the unknown and uh, um, saying that support in making a step that allows you to grow rather than running away that I have run away I mean I don't want to to point to like in front of certain challenges sometime at work or in personal lives you know it's easy it's easier to run away but that doesn't help me or other people grow and ultimately it's a sign of not caring, of not caring of myself and not caring of these people. I don't know if I answer your question. No. Oh, you did, thank you, thanks. Um, just going to maybe open up the floor now to a couple of questions, if anybody would like to ask Mauro any questions. You're, you're talking to a rocket scientist now, so you can ask really complicated questions. <sighs> 20 years ago, I made my pilgrimage and, um, you know, I was always inspired by the uh, Apollo moon landings and so on. And uh, th there is one um, particular image that I find absolutely really inspiring. And that's the, um, it's not, it's not landing on the moon. It's the, uh, the earth, earth rise uh, yep. over the moon. And, uh, you know, I, I, it, it, I find that really inspirational because, uh, the, the Apollo 8 astronauts, they, they're going around the moon and uh, they're at the moment, <clears throat> they're reading uh, from the book of Genesis and it's around Christmas time. And uh, yes. then they just, by, by complete another chance, they never planned it, but they, they took this picture and then they realized they were earth rise. So the question is, you know, I'm just a lay person. I'm, I'm not a scientist, or, but I, I get uh, still to find a sense of awe and inspiration from, from that little picture, from that story. And someone like yourself, 
do you find a sense of awe and a sense of inspiration um, from things like that in your work? Absolutely. By the way, I met the guy that took the picture. And um, what I have uh, observed, and even in, particularly in the, in the first, um, I'll ask regarding the astronaut and then about myself, like, um, um, like generally there are most, most people that I great, greatly appreciate for their um, raw, raw uh, simplicity and um, raw um, thankfulness because they have the opportunity to see the earth from outside. Like, and um, I think it starts off even with their selection process. I don't know if you guys know the selection process for US astronauts. So there is a first a CV step, and there is a physical step, physical exam step. Then there is a, a test, like they call your friends and ask them, does this person has ever done any activity that if that person fails, would kill somebody else or end themselves? Then a very thorough, uh, thorough uh, medical exam that lasts a week, in which you find out more about your body that you want to know. And then a last step that, um, let's say that uh, one of the four people that are on the podium right now go spend a week together and the two at the table have to pick one or the other two. And it's totally a choice. And so since the beginning, these people receive the, the task that they wanted to do for their own life as a gift because they have been chosen. And um, I describe this to describe the, the thankfulness that is there. And uh, from a certain point of view, um, similarly, the awareness of the gift that, I mean, friends around you, that things happening to you people you I encounter like um, I'm mean another example like for example the way we attach the heat shield was um, came up through an open selection like an open um, like we basically put up the problem to the whole company more around 10,000 people and receive more than 200 contribution and then like summarizing all of that came up a novel way of doing things that none of us have ever thought and like in front of that being grateful even to the people that ask you to do things that are damn like not very smart but in trying to give them answer you have to i have to try to crystallize and make things clearer to myself so that I can explain it to other people. And if not clear, that means that I don't have the reasons and I need to clarify. So even being thankful, sometimes, sometimes even for things that immediately don't uh, correspond, you know? Um, you were saying earlier that Running away does not help you grow. And I was curious, what, what do you rest on? What gives you the, either the strength or the humility or the patience that's needed not to run away in front of challenges? I mean, provided some, <laughs> not, it's been not only one time that I've run away, but like um, generally that does not, resolve things from a technical point of view, from a human point of view, and then uh, it leaves some dissatisfaction that uh, um, leads like uh, something in your that you feel like it's not 
and, and, and from a certain point of view, it doesn't it doesn't go away. So sometimes even just the weight dealing with that weight that sits here, you know, and um, um, is what is needed. And like I was telling a friend last night that um, I remember when uh, it became clearer and clearer that um, our, at SpaceX, our task was clearly to go to Mars. And you, I was like, hmm, this is like a pr pretty monumental task. Like it's pretty scary, you know, it's like, and uh, I was thinking, if that doesn't go well, what should I be doing after? Like, should I start to learn something else? And I went and brought up this question to a friend of mine that is actually in Ireland right now. And um, he brought up the fact that, like, uh, why am I afraid of the desire that is born into somebody else? Like, uh, if that provides a long if, if the the different difference in potential between the two poles is big, it means that it's going to be a big strike. So you can generate a lot of light and uh, in you and in, in the world. So why run away? So what has been helpful, I found, is um, to be educated in kind of not perceiving reality in this way, what uh, what even Ning was saying about the school of community, like a way of learning what is at the root of myself and of the world. What if like even the video was saying, if truly this mysterious presence that we call God became man, if that is the case, what does that have to tell who am I in the moment? And uh, also seeing that apply in eyes that are alive, that by being alive reminds you of that perspective because um, if, like the video was saying, if God became man, but you don't see any alive man, like very alive, you you would expect that uh, God became man means that enthusiasm is exponential exponentially present in a person. Like sadness is exponentially present in a person. Like uh, loving is exponentially present. Like if so, like seeing that present. In, pe in moments of people or in people to reopen up the window within myself, who am I? Who is this mysterious amount of matter that now gives recognition to what the whole universe is and the whole history of the universe. And all of us are like that. Not, I'm not saying me, just like human conscience. Just what, what you were saying there about love, like the, the readings at the moment are mass, is this love is the most powerful thing over everything. And just the words I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you say is, you know, the, the concreteness of, of understanding yourself is, is I suppose, in the, in the presence of your friends, that concrete reality. Um, and the gratitude in front of this, you know, that you have, that's very striking, you can see that. And um, talking about gratitude, thank you once again for, for being here um, and just for sharing your, your journey. It's a, quite a unique journey. And um, anybody that's here tonight, we have, um, we have a, a lovely testimony that you gave as well. Um, so I, I'll, 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 we can send that on to everybody if there's... there's um, anyone would like that. So thank you very much for your time and I hope you'll stay. We only have another 10 minutes left just to hear our, our next witness um, who is uh, Filippo and he is married 
Uh, he's a father to two boys. He's a qualified chartered accountant and eight years ago he moved to Ireland from Italy for work and he's a part-time soccer coach and catechist. So um, he's just going to share with us his journey in the last couple of years, um, um, particularly in the area of educating our young people. Thanks, Hilda. Um, yeah, father of two, and um, our eldest son at the beginning of the pandemic was um, seven and a half years, and he was due to get his first communion and first confession in a few months, but then, of course, the pandemic struck. We were all locked at home, and, um, and so homeschooling and everything that ensued. And um, as you can imagine, during the homeschooling, the, the teaching was focused mainly on just on literacy and li very few other things. So the preparation for a sacrament was not one of the priorities for the school. And that went on uh, for almost a couple of years. So there was quite a backlog building of children that didn't, didn't receive communion, didn't receive any preparation at all for, for that moment. And together with another couple of parents that are here tonight that had children in the same uh, age bracket, we, you know, we, we said to ourselves, okay, we, we have been those through, those through, through years, and, um, but say, our children, you know, are starting to ask questions. So why do you go to church? Why do you watch the mass online while it goes online? And, um, we realized it was important not to uh, let those questions go and help them prepare for what would have happened anyway. Um, and even when the schools restarted, we realized that, understandably so, the teachers were mostly concerned with filling the gaps that those children had accumulated in literacy and other key skills. And um, parishes had been closed more than any other kind of activity. So. And I, my wife works in the parish as well, so I know how much backlog they had to catch up with. And um, so we realized it was a call to us parents to get our children prepared for the First Communion. And we said, okay, once we realized that, we said, okay, where do we start? And um, so we asked for help and we found good materials, but, you know, a book in itself is not enough. And um, I think my was saying earlier, there, there was no playbook for this kind of situation as well. And, uh, but we, you know, we had encountered uh, a method, and um, I think, at least what was helpful for me, that the method that Father Giussani uh, outlined in the risk of education, um, I'll just call it out very briefly in three points. Present the past, the tradition, so all the sedimented layers that build up the questions and answers uh, that, that form our past. Because if you don't, kids are going to come up with their own explanations or are going to fall for whatever the world is trying to tell, to sell them at the moment. To make it real in the present. So what does this tradition have to say about the present? Otherwise, it's just a possibly interesting past, but still a past. It doesn't explain anything in the present. And third, freedom. So don't impose what you're saying as a dogma, but let them make the test uh, with the reality and see if what you have presented them holds in the present, has something to say in the present. And um, I mean, there, there were some, <clears throat> I would say, aspects uh, of, that, uh, of that book, The Risk of Education, that were I would say he probably would have written differently if he was thinking about parents in a pandemic that couldn't meet each other. I would say a fourth point that was essential for us was know your limits. So when you're not so sure about some questions that are so fundamental, we had the help of, um, of a couple of priests that, um, you know, that allowed us to, to, to give a proper answer, you know, without um, starting any heresy or giving them any, you know, full start. Um, so what was in it for me? <clears throat> so definitely, if it wasn't for those circumstances, 
um, we would have given for granted the preparation for sacraments. We wouldn't have cared, and our kids would have lost an opportunity to ask questions in a way that they enjoyed, because it wasn't something that we imposed on them. It's something that we did together with them. We met the first time, they loved it, and they said, okay, let's do it again. And each time we were meeting, they said, okay, we want more, we want more, and say, okay, <laughs> Let, let's keep going. And um, <clears throat> I think for me personally, it was an opportunity to experience what St. Peter says in, in the first letter. Um, so be ready to properly answer to anyone that asks for the reason of the hope that's in you. And I think it's interesting that I think most likely he was thinking of the early apostles that, that were going around the world. But that sentence is just after he, uh, say, provides uh, advices to newly married couples. So I don't know he was preparing them to, you know, this is what you'll have to do as a parent. Uh, definitely that was what happened for us. And um, if I have to summarize what happened over the last couple of years in, um, in a sentence, I think there is um, a song from Leonard Cohen anthem that we have sung a few times over the last couple of years that says it all. And um, it says, ring the bell that still can ring. So <clears throat> was it the most favorable time to think to step up uh, like a faith group for young kids? Probably not without you know, being able to meet in person and having a lot of other uh, restrictions. But was it possible to do something? Yes, definitely. And that's <clears throat> where we started. Then he goes on. Uh, forget your, perf your perfect offering. Was I a trained catechist? Definitely not. Uh, was I planning to be one? No. Uh, but um, was it, um, was, I mean, was it worth doing it? Yes, definitely. Um, and then he finishes, there is a crack in everything, and that's where the light gets in. And I think that was, that has been the experience for both parents and children. Um, so it, it, we went through difficult times in our family, within our families, between our families, but um, that was the crack that allowed um, this, this flower to flourish. Um, I, I was just listening to you because I've done a lot of work with young people as well. Um, very in teaching and various youth groups and just a, a couple of things there you said really uh, kind of resonated that when, when we talk about freedom like our when, when we're with young people like you can't hide from them they, they are looking at you you've probably noticed that you know they they won't accept they won't be fobbed off you have to be very you have to bring yourself um, that's all you can bring in front of young people you bring yourself yeah, and that's where you have to be honest. And if you don't know something or if you don't want to give them the wrong steer, you say, you know what, we'll ask Father James or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, you know, what you said about the freedom again, that, that it's, we have to be propositional. We have to remain very faithful to, to tradition, to the past, because then you can, you know, you have to be educated in that first. And then you, pro you pr proposition them to say, you know, is this, this has helped me because you can only bring yourself, and is this something that you think will help you? And they have to test it, and that's a real risk. We have to, we have to um, bet on our young people. You know, we have to risk. And, and in this age, where you know everything, you have to be so careful of what you say, and you know, uh, child protection. But there has to be that that tension of of sharing of yourself and risking, which which you are doing in your, in your group. Yeah, and um, you see, you see that it works, if you want, when children start doing the same. And when someone has a question, they, someone steps in and try to give the answer, you know, which again was not something that I was expecting would happen, but it did. And it's amazing too, with young people, the questions that they ask. You know, I'm sure you've experienced that, the, they, they, they'll push you and they'll really, they'll see things that, that we don't see. 
They're like little philosophers, aren't they? Or they would reawaken things that, um, as Mara was saying, we, were, we have tried to put to bed. Yes. But then they were still there waiting for us. Yeah, well, they won't let you away with it. They'll keep pushing until they get their answer. And that's, that's the amazing thing about working with young people. And even what Mara was saying, to you know that it, it's it's you, you started off there was a reality in front of you, and like Mara with the bowl trying to figure out you know looking at this what what is this is looking at the the core things that are in front of you, and it's in in, in in looking at the little details like that that something can grow, paying attention to that that something can grow from that. Yeah, and at the same time with young people, I mean you need to have a plan, otherwise it's. The risk of falling into anarchy is, 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 is quite easy, I mean, but at the same time you have to keep their pace and if they want, if they have questions on some particular thing which you thought was not significant, if it's important for them, then it becomes important. And are they still asking to meet and continue? Oh yeah, 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 no, it's, uh, so we started with three families, then four more joined and uh, yeah, it's um, and Filippo, still like, evolving. And I suppose they're seeing all of you and the parents involved, and that's always, it's, it's, it's not what we say sometimes, it's how we are in front of, in front of our young people. And how would you say that, that you have changed over the last few years? Has this had a, an impact on you? Well, see, um, I think the most important thing was um, not to give, you know, that moment. The, um, so my first child and now... Uh, in a few months, my second, uh, you know, getting familiar with the sacraments, with Christ and the church, and really getting, you know, having questions that they had reawakened in me, mm -hmm. and um, that, as we were saying earlier, one may try to put things to bed, but they don't sleep, and um, so you'd better, you know, have a conversation. It's a journey you're going on with them. Yeah, it's a privileged journey with our young people. Would anybody like to ask a question? So it's actually for, uh, um, it connect, connects the intervention from Mauro and, the, and what you were saying about uh, the crack and, uh, and the kids' uh, dynamic. Um, we are in a university and, uh, and in uh, scientific research, uh, especially at your level, for me, it's always interesting to see how uh, people like uh, Piccinini who was a, a doctor and went into a conference with other doctor and he said, you know, the way I do my profession depends on the encounter I had with a priest, which is something that left obviously all the scientific community in the room completely baffled. And I, I wonder, I think what you just started your intervention with that what you got from the moment is the value of experience. The value of experience in also for scientific experiment, it's something that means something very precise. And uh, so gaining this from the experience of the moment is also that changes the way you work, clearly. That's what you were saying all along, giving you, uh, I, I have experienced that myself, giving you, even in time of failures, the opportunity to be open to learn from those failures, to learn from the experiment, the reality can be something very useful for you. And, uh, and normally, I don't, I don't see this happening as a, as a normal dynamic, because uh, often the more, the higher you go, the more you have also uh, the problem of defending your reputation, and a failure experiment is often not a luxury that you can afford, depending on where you are, in, in what context you, you, you are. You know, uh, I say that this openness towards the crack, looking at reality as a possibility that through the cracks we get some light, having this uh, childlike openness to the opportunity of making mistakes and learning from them truly, uh, it's, uh, it's a gift in itself, and it's a gift that we learn in this experience. And, and I, I see a similarity between, you know, the way we learn from kids and the way we can become and, and stay childlike, yeah. even as experienced adults in our profession. And uh, to me, that's in itself, it can be an amazing opportunity. 
So I wanted to ask you out, you know, yeah, again. In, in, the, in the environment where I work now, uh, it's more similar to the kids' environment than the adults' environment you were describing. Because um, what is not very tolerated is that when you don't know, you say, I know. Or you make your hypothesis as an explanation without declaring that is an hypothesis. And that does not build anything. Because, I mean, if it's an, if an explanation, you need to be able to explain it and defend it very clearly. And if there are things that are not clear, the honesty of saying, I don't know, it's very valuable because then you start searching for people that can help you. Because the problem is not what a firm, what you, what you or what I can do, but is to solve the problems. If the interest goes away from solving the problem or for learning, then it becomes a castle of lies that is generally very unstable externally and internally and uh, it does take I mean especially in a world where you have to take everything to the fairly extreme because you don't have much performance to throw away it's not like for example um, war jet, like jets that go fighter jets where you just take an enormously powerful engines and you put it on stuff that has not any shape of a flying wing, but there is so much power there and you put enough control services that you can do whatever you want. When uh, when you're dealing with uh, rockets, you don't have enough mass to, to play with. So like pretending that you know things, but in reality you don't, generates unflyable objects that basically defy the purpose of what you're trying to do. So the dishonesty is not very much tolerated. And in environments where that is tolerated generates companies that don't fly objects. And they, they generate a lot of paperwork that doesn't fly. Thanks, Mara. I think we're um, on a bit of a time schedule here now. Uh, so I'd like to just do the thank yous for tonight. Um, to the chaplains again here for, for hosting us, to Chiara and to Dylan for all their technical work, um, Sylvia once again, and those who are also working in the background, um, attending the various meetings to, to organize this. Um, thanks to Ning for her time in recording this testimony, Maro for zooming in from your busy schedule, and Filippo for his presence and witness here tonight. Uh, just before we go, um, we have on your seats our next event, which is the Christmas concert, and it's going to be in Donnybrook Parish Church on Saturday, the 10th of December. It's an evening of songs, Christmas songs, and readings just to prepare us for Christmas. And also at the back of the hall, just on your way out, we have some books available, Jasani's autobiography, and, um, oh yeah, sorry, did I thank Catherine for the catering, the lovely food at the, the back of the hall. So thanks to everyone for coming and uh, have a safe journey home.